we're going to begin a new unit here now as we tackle the enormous field of language in all its forms and shapes and sizes. Language is possibly the richest topic within cognitive science. There are so many aspects to language that uh, suggest themselves that it will not be pinned down by any single approach. Um, we have so many questions to ask about language, what it is, well, we might hold off on before we decide what we mean by language until we see many ways in which language um, is integrated into our lives. So if I asked you why do we have language, the first answer would normally be communication. I would say, why do we have language? You say, well, we talk to each other or we write to each other. We exchange messages. We, we communicate using language. And that's obviously right, but it's by no means the whole story. And before we build up to looking at how we perhaps communicate with each other, there's a second role for language, which suggests itself, and that is thought. Now, those look like two rather different roles. I don't like to use the word functions because that suggests that someone knows what's going on. But certainly our use of the term language describes patterns of communication, but also seems to describe something around that rather nebulous idea of thinking. Perhaps there's more to language than these two roles. Now, in the first unit, we met the collision between philosophy of mind, drawing from the computer metaphor, and language theory, linguistic theory, in the work of Noam Chomsky. And we met it primarily here in the person of Jerry Fodor, the philosopher, who wrote this book called Language of Thought. And we noted that thinking is not something that we have a definition for. We speak with some confidence of thinking, but it's not clear what we mean when we use that word. Um, so... Just like so many words in cognitive science, like mind, for example, we will hold off on being too determined about what thinking means and see if we can articulate some, perhaps, subsets of what we mean by thinking, some ways in which this word can be worked into something we can run with. And in this, this is where Jerry Fodor comes in, because he's suggesting that um, some of what we mean when we say thinking, not all, but some of what we mean when we say thinking, is language-like. It has structure like sentences, thoughts have a beginning and an end, they have se their sequences, and furthermore, they often have the appearance of statements or sentences. Um, one of the insights, key insights in linguistic theory, was that you can take uh, Word, small elements like words, combine them according to rules, and in so doing produce complex things, which are going to be se sentences or utterances, um, where the complexity arises from the sequencing of the elements. Now, back when I was a kid, we used to rob orchards. We would climb over walls and go in and steal apples. Imagine, if you will, three young boys planning on stealing some apples. And they might have a thought, one of them might have a thought, which I'm going to write here as a sentence, but which I want you to think of as more of a, as an internal plan. If three of us sneak in the back, we can steal at least a bag of apples without getting caught. It seems familiar. I can totally believe that I had that kind of thought prior to stealing apples from an orchard. Um, statute of limitations protects me, I think. This is a complex thought. Look what all is in this thought. How many of those core elements of actually cognition are in here? So there's quantity. We've got three. We've got not only an action, but a, a mode of action, sneaking. We've got a counterfactual. There's an if there, which means that we're, count, we're considering two possible scenarios, doing this and not doing this. As well as quantity in three, we've got approximate quantity in at, at least a bag of apples. And furthermore, after apples, we've got this last bit about without getting caught, which also 
seems to play with possible futures in which one, one of which we get caught and another one we don't get caught. So this sentence is really, really complex and it's questionable whether it would be possible to have this thought without language. It seems like the kind of structure provided by language seems to provide, as it were, the, the bare bones of this thought. Jerry Fodor coined the term mentalese to refer to this role of language-like sequences of units in structuring thought. Now, this is not the last word on the topic by any means. This is not a completely fleshed out idea. So you're free at this stage to um, introduce your own concerns. Ask yourself, perhaps think about this over the next few days. When would you describe yourself as thinking in language? And if so, is if it's language, is it, is it how like speech is it? Can you think in more than one language? Perhaps if you can speak in more than one language, you can think in more than one language, do you? If you have more than one language at your disposal, when would you say you would you say you think in one or the other? Or do you have the thought and then choose the language? If this is like speaking in some sense, then is, is there a voice associated with it? Can you have a thought in a different accent? Could you have, could you, like a Photoshop filter, could you change your thoughts and have them in the accent of groundskeeper Woody from The Simpsons, for example? And if thought is like language, is there something like a voice then going on when you read? Or how should we understand reading and thinking? There's no answers to these questions. There's no right answers. These are just for you to think about to make sense of this idea of thought and language as being relevant to each other. We don't know what a thought is, so you're exploring this area for yourself to make your own mind up. You should keep your eye out for when that thing which you rely on, which you call thinking, how much of it plausibly is words, or do you think that your thinking is of a different nature? This kind of rather ill-formed debate has been at the heart of cognitive science for decades and decades. Um, this is why we won't, no more than mind, will we say what thought is, but we approach this then, drawing out, teasing out certain aspects of it. So Jerry Fodor teases out this language-like element to some aspects of what we might call thought or thinking. It's important to realize how poorly defined such words are because while we use them in an everyday sense with confidence, we speak of ourselves as thinking. We understand ourselves to be thinking. That's, that, that, that's how, that's the, the way we think about ourselves. In fact, it's a it's language we use to think about ourselves and to think about thinking. But in conversation, when a word has, is this poorly defined, it's quite possible for two people to mean rather different things. Um, so having a degree of uncertainty about what we mean by thought is important. And Jerry Fodor's language of thought hypothesis suggests one specific role for language and its relation to thought and cognition. It's by no means the final story, but it plays a very important role. We want to then to be a little bit more specific about what it means when we, the language of thought hypothesis describes mental processes as computational processes defined over representations. Let me tease those apart. So mental processes, in order to ensure that we're talking somehow about thinking, now understood as computational processes, that means the assembly rearrangement of symbolic structures made up of sequences of symbols, which are transformed according to rule. This is the core metaphor of the computational paradigm in the computational theory of mind. But those symbols must necessarily be about something. That's why we call them representations. Representations are things that stand for something. They symbolize them, or they depict them, or they are in some sense, which we will explore, about things. This is true for words, it's true for images, and we'll be exploring the concept of representation in some depth. The computational theory of mind is very much concerned with 
thinking along these lines, elaborating our inner mental life along these lines, and then asking, well, what kinds of symbols assembled using what kinds of rule-based processes, manipulated using what kinds of rule-based processes, uh, give rise to thought. Now, with this, we've opened up something we started, language has to do with communication, that's public. We can see people communicating, we can see people talking to each other in the bar, if we ever get to a bar again. But thinking is very much more usually conceived of as something that one person does at a time. So we're talking here about inner speech. When we move on to the topic of development, which will be our next unit, we'll return to this relationship between inner speech and outer speech, because there's a crucial moment in the development of a child at which this relationship becomes somewhat clearer. <laughs>